Welcome back to another episode here on CapTech. As a follow-up to our video on infamous and unsolved crimes of the Illinois Valley, the team here at CapTech uh, next wanted to put Southern Illinois under the cold case microscope as well. Before diving into the top 10 infamous and unsolved cases of Little Egypt, first I should point out that I was closer than intended to my own Southern Illinois cold case, a story that I'll tell briefly here in efforts to set the stage prior to diving into our top 10. The year was 1996 and I was finishing my undergraduate degree at SIU Carbondale. I lived with a lovable bunch of hooligans on Elm Street in efforts to find uh, another bullet point to add to our very thin, at the time, uh, resumes. One of my roommates and I decided to uh, pledge a fraternity, despite the fact that we somewhat prided ourselves prior to that on being independent. Indie baby! The agreement we made with the fraternity was that we'd pay dues and attend events, but we were not going to take part in any other traditional hazing activities. This frat could um, charge us dues, assign us some weekly tasks, but their membership numbers um, were terrible. And as far as my roommate and I uh, were concerned, this uh, frat could help us build our resumes while we help build up their enrollment numbers. But neither my roomie or I wanted the resume bullet badly enough to do any um, true hazing. This caused some consternation um, between the real members that had to go through the actual hazing and the uh, two of us. Eventually, I saw it was not going to be a uh, good fit, but uh, my roommate pressed forward despite constantly griping, you know, about the amount of work um, and treatment being required of him to get into the uh, fraternity. Like most other Carbondale roommates, was quite the drinker. So much so that the clerks at the liquor store on uh, Carbondale's main drag there would actually heckle the guy for buying only a six-pack at a time. Like, why you only buying six? You know, you'll be back. Anyway, to make a long story short, this quasi-frat house burned down um, in the 90s while I was there in what was believed to be an arson. The Carbondale fire chief, or at least one of his top delegates, 20-year-old me wouldn't know the difference, would go on to question my uh, roommate on the front porch of our Elm Street house one morning. I woke up to the conversation after a long night of partying. Um, it's quite sobering. I don't think uh, my roommate did it, and I certainly have no proof, but he was so darn drunk most of the time, I don't know to this day if he had, had done it. I mean, nobody died or anything. I remember asking him, and he seemed annoyed that I'd even raised the issue, and um, I was given a flippant uh, denial. And I never asked again. Now maybe you are thinking to yourself that this isn't that huge of a crime. After all, nobody was injured. The fire damage was eventually able to be repaired. And I'd be inclined to uh, agree with you on this point. But nevertheless, I wanted to share my own a personal Southern Illinois crime story uh, before diving into the top 10 infamous and unsolved crimes of Southern Illinois. First, let's cover another alleged arson. Dateline, 1992, Carbondale, Illinois. Sunday, December 6, 92, should have marked the end of a long weekend of holiday celebration. On Wednesday, Carla Copey recalled the Lights Fantastic Parade the night before the tragic Pyramid Apartments fire. With pride, she'd watch members of the International Student Council march alongside a large... Uh, Metal globe carrying highlight, uh, carrying lighted candles symbolizing peace on earth. Kopi was assistant director of the International uh, Student Services at the time and was awakened hours later uh, by a phone call from her boss who asked her to, to join him at the Pyramid Apartments at 504 South Rawling Street in Carbondale. It was a very cold night and thick smoke hung in the air over Rawling Street, Kopi said. Forever etched in my mind's eye will be the vision of the frozen columns of ice covering the charred remains of the apartment building. I knew immediately from the expressions on the faces of the firemen that students had perished. Five SIU students died in the fire. Four were international students. Several others were in critical condition, some having jumped from uh, top floors to escape the flames. 
Authorities believe the fire was the result of arson, but a suspect was never identified. The Carbondale Police Department lists the fire as a cold case to this day. Next, let's jump into the murder cases. If you've ever woken up after a sunset concert in Carbondale, feeling like hell, almost wishing you were dead, just be glad that you woke up at all, since Carbondale police say they are still investigating the July 13, 2006 death of Ryan Livingston. The 22-year-old was walking home from a sunset concert when he was stabbed to death by two men during an apparent robbery on West Walnut Street. With any information, call the Carbondale police. Next, Keith Brown's homicide remains open in Southern Illinois. Keith Brown lived in Buckner, a small town in Franklin County, and Keith's wife reported him missing on February 3rd, 1993, and he has now been gone for over 25 years. His blue 1989 Plymouth hatchback was discovered two days later in a remote area near Crab Orchard Lake. Keith Brown's skeletal remains were found uh, near Crab Orchard Lake in June 93, but they were in a different location than his car months after he turned up missing. His remains were discovered when a farmer encountered his remains and reported them to the Williamson County Sheriff's Department. Keith had died from gunshot wounds. Keith worked as a nurse at local nursing homes. Did he anger somebody he worked with? Did he fire someone? who sought revenge. Keith enjoyed fishing at Crab Orchard Lake. Did he encounter someone at that isolated area near the lake who killed him at random? Although much time has since passed, there's someone out there that has the information needed to solve this case. And as a side note to my father, I can't believe you sent me down to school with all this stuff going on there. At the same time or right after. Anyway, next on our list, Lisa Dawn Carnes was brutally murdered in Massac County, Illinois, in March 1984. Lisa Karn's nude body was found in a rural area near Macedonia Church Road and U.S. Highway 45. She had been brutally murdered and left to die in a rural field. Karn's truck was later located roughly four miles from the site where her body was located. Her family tends to suspect that she knew her killer and had some connection with that killer. Three decades after her body was found in that uh, rural Massac County field, the murder of Lisa Ann Carnes remains unsolved, even though her pickup truck was found, her clothes were found between the truck and a rural country road, a large amount of blood uh, was found on a back porch of an unoccupied farmhouse while her body was found about a quarter mile away. She died from a bullet to the back. And the working theory was that she ran from the farmhouse for help and finding no one there fled through the field. Next on our list, did you ever think that crime even occurred in Collinsville, Illinois? An idealistic little town home to the world's largest ketchup bottle and the horseradish festival. The rumor has that one of the Smashing Pumpkins even went to high school there, but I digress. But in Collinsville, an unidentified white female was discovered on July 20th, 1990. This unidentified white film female body was found in a bean field approximately 40 feet north of Lebanon Road, a tenth of a mile west of Troy and O'Fallon Road in what is technically uh, Jarvis Township. Uh, the victim's death resulted from multiple cutting and stab wounds to the neck and torso. Her fallopian tubes, uterus, and ovaries were also missing. Evidence of surgical removal could not be determined, and no defensive wounds were even found on the victim. The body appeared to have been placed at the site two to three days prior to the discovery. Next case, on 1-30-2002, an unidentified African-American female was found near mile marker 22 on Interstate 64 in what the team over here at CapTech pronounces rural Maz Cooter. For those of you who pronounce it otherwise, the discovery of skeletal remains happened when a complaint originated from workers of the Illinois Department of Transportation, or IDOT, who were working in the area and discovered the remains. 
At the direction of the St. Clair County's coroner office, the remains were transferred to St. Mary's Hospital in East St., where an autopsy was performed. The autopsy, performed by James Petrachak, revealed the following information about the deceased. Believed to be an African-American female, approximately 25 years old, with two rings on the left hand and a light blue-colored, tear-shaped stone in one of them, wearing a black-colored, sleeveless, one-piece Jason Matthews brand jumpsuit. The autopsy could not determine the cause of death, and it is believed that the victim had been deceased for several months. Anyone with information concerning the identity of this victim or the circumstances surrounding her death are highly urged to contact the Illinois State Police. Our next case. If you thought the worst thing about Madison County was class action lawsuits and being confused with the county that had all the bridges on it, you'd only get a silver medal here. Near the Silver Creek overpass in rural Madison County at mile marker 23 on eastbound 70, a black female victim was found on 3-11-2002. A subsequent autopsy could not determine the cause of death and it is believed that the victim had been deceased four to six months. Our next case, the Columbia Police Department and Major Case Squad, who started an investigation of skeletal remains on March 28, 2002, that were found on a creek bed on Route 3, uh, near Gall Road in Columbia, investigators located a size XL green shirt with a, with a large M and the word Maverick in orange or yellow lettering across the um, front of the shirt at the scene were a pair of khaki colored size 3 Chaz credentials shorts. This African American female was aged between 33 and 50 and around 5 foot 1 inches. She was believed to have delivered a child or children. The forensic examiner believed that she had been deceased at least six months, but not more than a year. This would mean that she went missing somewhere about March 2001. Someone had to have missed her. Anyone with information surrounding this crime is asked to contact the uh, Columbia Police Department. The case of Lisa Uzel isn't as old or as cold as many and maybe there was someone out there willing to uh, come forth and talk about what happened to her. She was a well-known postal worker with a uh, mail route through Marion, Illinois. She was found in late 2014 in what remained of her burning home, and she died from a gunshot wound. The fire was probably set to destroy the evidence, and it did uh, a lot of that. Her contacts could be tracked down through her cell phone using her phone and text messages and internet usage for a uh, day of her death. So maybe they will solve that one. Last case, January 1993, an unknown female found in Wayne Fitzgerald State Park in Jefferson County, referred to by the locals as Jeffco. This case is particularly interesting because the victim had a condition that would be obvious um, since only the head was located. This was uh, most likely a homicide and the rest of the body concealed somewhere else, uh, maybe even in nearby Jeffco. Post-mortem examination revealed the victim had approximately shoulder length uh, reddish brown hair. Analysis by the U of I anthropology department indicated the victim's age ranged between 30 to 50 years old. Unusual skeleton uh, remains um, of the upper skull and upper front cervical vertebrae indicate the victim suffered from chronic spasmodic torticollis or Wynek, a condition that causes stress on the muscles which are responsible for maintaining upright head posture. Evidence of a healed 
uh, traumatic lesion on the skull suggests this condition may have been preceded by head trauma. This would have resulted in the victim maintaining a leftward tilt of the head. Anyone with information um, that would help identify this unidentified victim is urged to contact the Jefferson County Sheriff's Department. Are you saying to yourself, Cap, was that 11 cases instead of 10? And I say, it probably was, but why don't you just add it to your list of Southern Illinois infamous and unsolved mysteries. Thanks for watching this rather macabre episode here on Cap Tech. While most of our videos try to strike a bit of a happier tone, we do on occasion uh, enjoy diving into the darkness. Please check out the rest of our videos on Southern Illinois and our other episode of Infamous and Unknown Crimes focused more on the uh, central Illinois area. Please remember to like, comment, share, and subscribe to CapTech, and go Southern, go!